Hello and welcome to Unprofessional Engineering. My name is James. You got Luke. Luke, looking at another top 10 list this week. This time, the top 10 military vehicles of all time. Of all time. Uh, most of mine were older, though, because the were new they? ones the new ones are cool-ish, but the old school ones are just, uh, they were so awesome. I really I, enjoyed this one. I, I'm a military, like, I love military movies. I love all things military. So this one, the fact that not a lot of them were American vehicles, oh. like U.S. military vehicles, well, not all of them, but quite a few of them were not U.S. military vehicles. They were others in my list, at least. I love our troops, Luke. I love Boom. all troops. How'd you like that? I love all I the troops. Well, I mean, and maybe not all the troops, but ours for sure. Um, disclaimer, guys. at least for my top 10 list. Oh, no. I'm not condoning war, not condoning violence, not against the military, um, none of those things. And also, do not take this as some sort of scientific research. These were the things that I thought were super cool or things that I have some sort of connection to that I really like. Mine was based off of the pictures. Yes. In, in the <laughs> like, most cases. That looks neat. So okay. you Google cool military vehicles and you go to images and you just find the Oh, did the you do that? Thing. That's I nice. Did. Okay. Do you want to start or do you want me to? Okay. So here's how we're going to do this, folks. Uh, James and I are just going to go through our lists. No particular order. And then at the end, we're going to attempt... You know, James and I always butt heads. We do. Uh, we're going to attempt to fashion a top 10 list from the 20 total that we've come up with. So Absolutely. My very first one, I'm coming right out of the gate with, I think is going to be in the top three when we finish oh my here, goodness. is the Vespa 150 Tap. So this was... So you know what a Vespa is. A I little do. That's why, scooter, that's why I that's why I gave you that look. Go ahead. Uh, so it was an anti-tank scooter designed for use by French paratroopers. Ooh. So what they would do is they would jump out of a plane with one? Well, it had a parachute on it. Well, yeah. So they would send uh two of these scooters and two French paratroopers would go down. One of the scooters would carry these big, huge 75 millimeter, you know, rounds. The other one, imagine a Vespa with a giant cannon coming out of the front of it. That's, That's what this thing looks like. And it wasn't designed to be shot like while it was moving. Like it oh, wasn't a scooter tank. But you could apparently like cut some wires and shut off all the safety devices. And at close range, you could actually fire this thing. Oh from the goodness. scooter moving. Uh, there were 600 of these built between the years 1956 and 1959. The crazy thing was they were capable of penetrating 100 millimeters of armor at a range of 3.9 miles. I don't know how they know all that specific detail, how but that seems, not? I mean, what's 100 millimeters? Uh, how many inches is that? So 25... That's a lot of, that, that can't be right. Uh, that's that's 3.6 inches, basically. 3.7. Three, three, yeah, yeah. I, I guess that's okay. Yeah, so, so they, they go th through three or four inches of armor. I can see that. Uh, at almost four miles. That's pretty impressive. From a Vespa. That's, yeah. <laughs> There's something to be said for that. The fact that it hops out of a plane makes me really happy. Very cool. All right. My first one that I'm going with, again, no particular order. Actually, they kind of are. Um, this is my least favorite of my top 10. The Challenger 2 battle tank. Did you see this thing? I Luke? did not see this thing. So, so this is a United Kingdom tank. Uh, came around in 1998. So a little bit newer than the Most. French Vespa from the plane. <laughs> um, it can handle a whole four members in the crew. Its main weapon is a 120 millimeter rifle. And its top speed is 37 miles per hour. That seems fast for a tank. It feels pretty fast. This thing's considered to be one of like the most beastly tanks out there, like ever, like of all time. So again, started in 98. So it's still pretty, pretty new, but it's so awesome that they think that it's going to run up through 2030. So that's still a long lifespan. Plus, you know, the military usually kind of extends that one out as far yeah. as I know. So that's cool. Um, it weighs in at just under 63 tons from what I saw. So that's pretty hefty to be moving at 37 miles per hour to be pushing that much weight. Um, the 120 millimeter cannon is a turret. So, you know, of course it can move all around super accurate lobbing shells over five miles. 
I, just, I, mean, I don't know how you're super accurate shooting anything five miles, but that's outstanding. It can be, right? I, I, I mean, maybe it makes such a big explosion that it's like, well, it, it was accurate because it was close. Near it. Yeah. In 2003, in the Iraq war, no Challenger 2 tanks were lost despite all sorts of enemy contact with them. There's also a story about one of these tanks that was hit by 14 RPG rockets at close range and it still survived. And they were like, problem. what was that? They're like, did we hit a fly or what? <laughs> so these things are just monsters. Really impressive. And if you look it up, super cool looking. Okay, my next one is the Volkswagen Schwimmwagen, which, <laughs> which literally translates to the swimming car. Oh, so nice. I love so, swimming cars. So this thing, like you remember what like the Volkswagen thing looked like. Remember the thing? It was it was this big boxy, like dune buggy kind of looking car. Uh so imagine gotcha. that painted green with a machine gun <laughs> bolted to the top of it, but it was amphibious. So it literally could just drive right into the water, and then the pilot or not pilot driver would then like tip the motor out the back and there's a little propeller and it could go from land to sea. It was actually even to this day, the most produced amphibious car ever made. There were 14,000 Schwimmwagens created between 1942 and 1944. It, It just, it looked like a green dune buggy again with a machine gun that could drive through the water. That's outstanding. The problem that I see is, and I'm just saying this, I saw some pictures and like how it was being used. They weren't very maneuverable. If if you've ever seen an amphibious car, they don't turn very well and they don't drive very fast. I mean, the closest thing I know is the Just Ducky tours. So (laughs) yes. So imagine like you're in a Just Ducky and you're trying to avoid enemy fire. And and it was completely open. There was no like cage around. It It was a dune buggy. So my guess is lots of people died whenever this thing hit the water, moving at a snail's pace and not being maneuverable. That does seem like a problem. But it's still, it's a car that's, it's a Volkswagen that swims with a gun on it. Yeah. So I'm going to stick with this amphibious theme Ooh. and I'm going to go with the AAV7A1 amphibious assault vehicle, the Amtrak. So um, durable, super battle tested around the globe. Um, the assault vehicle has like uh, for decades, it's been around and it shows up on shorelines just like this was. It drives around, hops in the water, the U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, is the one who usually takes advantage of this thing. So the interior cabin holds three crew members, not a lot, along with 21 uh, troops or up to 10,000 pounds of equipment. So not only can you move troops onto the shore, but also all of the equipment that you need on the other side of the water. In 2018, the Marines awarded a new contract for an updated version of the AAV, which is going to be smaller, but more powerful. Uh, (laughs) <laughs> the site that I said, it has a superpower and its superpower, of course, is versatility. Um, so at sea, it can go through really choppy water as high as 10 feet. So considering it's a car, that's pretty good. On land, it can hit speeds up to 45 miles per hour. Uh, so that's pretty good. Um, and it can also be used as a refueler or a field ambulance. You know, grab people, drive them away across the water and back to where they need to go. So you stole one of mine. Oh, that I'm was one of add, them? But I'm going to, yeah, it was one of oh, mine. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm going to add a little bit to it rather than yeah. doing a second one again. Uh, when I was a kid, I had G.I. Joe's. Oh, yeah. And by far the coolest accessory that you could get for the G.I. Joe's. And these were the little G.I. Joe's, depending on how old you are. The G.I. Joe's used to be like Barbie doll size. Monsters, yeah. I but never they, had those ones. They, they changed them to the little little plastic ones. And when I whenever I got the hovercraft for Christmas... I'm fairly certain I cried and (laughs) it was literally the best GI Joe vehicle that there was, was this, it was, it was just so cool. So I've always loved hovercrafts again, not super fast, not super maneuverable. Like these things, they don't turn on a dime. They tend to like turn really slow and wide. And so not sure how good they are at like, contact battle whenever you're like engaging the enemy like getting in and off the land seems pretty good but uh i can't imagine that um they're very maneuverable 
Did you blow up your GI Joes with little firecrackers? Oh my goodness gracious, yes. Okay, I think every kid alive did yeah. that, right? Oh, that was the best until you didn't have your GI Joe anymore. And now you can't sell it on eBay. One more from you, Luke, before we take a break. Uh, so my next one, this is the Zill, Z-I-L 2906, or there was a 4904. These were tanks mm. that had screw drives instead of tracks. You know how tanks have the two really? tracks on either side? That's so imagine two horizontal ginormous like they looked like torpedoes with screw threads on them really Mm -hmm. big they were like you know maybe a foot apart the threads and these things could literally go absolutely anywhere uh german design um there's all kinds of variations of this thing and interestingly the lighter or smaller versions because these uh the screws were hollow they could actually float the, the well, smaller neat. version of these had the ability to float. But imagine screws driving a tank through the water. Again, not super maneuverable, not super fast. But when you see videos of these, so if you check out like screw tanks or something like that, just Google the video. Uh, they can literally drive like on absolutely anything, you know, snow, water, mud, trees, people, other vehicles. I mean, oh. I mean, it's amazing the traction that these things have. I mean, it's literally like probably the best off-road vehicle like you could ever, ever have. That's cool. I did not see that one, but that's really awesome. Screw tank. It's pretty cool. Screw tank. All right. Before we move on, I think it's time to take a break for a word from our sponsor. Pentagon, DOD, Department of Defense. Nobody. Nobody loves us. But we do have some shout outs, which is even better, Luke. Who do we got? Numero uno, Melvin K says, I'd like to sponsor your next episode. Just kidding. I'm a broke college student. (laughs) Jerk. (laughs) However, if I were to sponsor an episode, I would want you to make the episode about the most useless things you've learned in college that another listener suggested in episode 193. At the time of writing you, you've released 59 other episodes. So I would say you've stalled long enough. (laughs) Well, I think the problem is, I don't know if we could squeeze that into a 30 minute episode. Yeah, all the useless stuff from college. Oh, I really appreciate that he's like calling us out on all of the stuff that we did. Well, James do, is so. super responsive to emails and like I things think it on only Facebook took me three and... weeks, four weeks to get back to Melvin from his email. So oh, that's a thing. Number two, Alex P wrote in, big fan. So you know, Alex started out pretty well. Okay. Mostly downhill from there. Warning. Oh, geez. oh no. A civil ugh, uh. from Philly. Double oh. But at least it isn't Jersey. So, you know, they got that going for him. Uh, also, active duty military and a grad student in the Air Force Institute. So I thought this was a oh, fitting nice. episode Very for a shout fitting. out. So already gave us a five star review. So you know what, Alex, you're OK in my book. And thank, thank you, you for very your service, much. Alex. Appreciate That's right. That. If any of you want a shout out on just this amazing podcast, if you want to give us some episode ideas, if you want to call us out on an episode we haven't done, whatever the case may be, maybe you just want some stickers, go ahead and email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. Keep in mind, those stickers will be anywhere from three (laughs) to two years away whenever you send your initial email. I do Uh, make it clear in my response (laughs) that it will take a long time. (laughs) Also, don't forget to like, subscribe, share, review. And as always, you can tell your smart devices to play the Unprofessional Engineering Podcast. There we go. My next one, Luke, moving along. The Skaroski UH-60A Black Hawk helicopter. Oh, yeah. 1979, it entered service in the U.S. Army's 101st Combat Aviation Brigade of the 101st Airborne Division. So, I I mean, these things are just iconic, right? I think that's why I picked this one. They're well, the movie, cool. Black Hawk Down. There's, right? there's the whole movie about it. There, uh, do you remember? Uh, well, I'll get into it in my, my whole spiel here. Uh, they're super nimble uh, helicopters made for combat. Uh, they made their debut in action in Granada in 1983. So shortly after being, you know, added to the the force, uh, they also played a huge 
role in the largest air assault mission in U.S. Army history in the Gulf War in 1991, where more than 300 Black Hawks were used. Do you remember that? Like, I still remember the video of like mm-hmm. just a massive number of these helicopters like flying through the sky. It was super cool looking. Yeah. Um, the Battlefield Bird can carry 11 troops and lift up to 2,600 pounds internally and 9,000 pounds via that like really big sling that they Mm -hmm. have connected to the bottom of it to haul stuff around. So at least one or two of me, they could pull around. Uh, It has super high tech avionics and electronics, uh, really advanced global positioning system, and some of the most superior like survival capabilities out there. So super cool stuff. And I'm told you can actually go buy one of these if you have enough cash in your pocket. Which we do for sure. From all of our big sponsor. Money. All righty. My next one is the Willys MB. This was the first military vehicle mass produced for Did the United States. Did you say Willys? So the Jeep, the original name of the Jeep was the Willys MB. W-I-L-L-Y-S. Uh, W-I-L-L-Y-S. And uh, from 1941 to 1945, and it, it later became Jeep. Uh, interesting. Whenever they did the initial contract, they were super concerned about production. So Ford actually made Jeeps for the military back in the day because Ford was obviously good with the assembly lines. Check out our uh, Henry Ford episode. Uh, it was the most successful military vehicle ever produced for war. And there's like multiple like quotes and different, you know, famous people that talk about it's, I think, uh, Ferrari Enzo, the founder of Ferrari said it was, it said it was America's only true sports car, which I'm not sure what that really meant. Um, and then it talked about how it's the most iconic vehicle that was ever built for whatever purpose. Uh And it's one of the few because the Humvee failed miserably. And it's not even on my list, Goodness, uh, but yes. it's one of the few military vehicles that actually transitioned from being a military vehicle to being uh, a, a vehicle for the everyday folk to buy. So I, I remember us talking about that previously and about how it came about and then Jeep acquired it. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe it was in our big three episode. About yeah, maybe. GM and those, but yeah, very cool. Yeah, very. Yeah. And it just I mean, everybody knows what the Jeep looks like. Oh, I mean, yeah. I, I used to watch the TV show MASH all the time and they were scooting around those little Jeeps all the time. And Gosh, you're so old. I, Mash. You, didn't, you didn't watch MASH? No, you and oh, my, my mom goodness. watched MASH. That was the, one of the best. My next one, the M70 multiple rocket launch system. Is this yeah. a vehicle or a weapon? Yes. Oh, it's a vehicle <laughs> weapon. <laughs> so the M70 was made for what they define as a shoot and scoot method of rocket launching. And firing. scoot? Shoot and scoot. Like you okay. shoot your rockets and then you scoot here. on out of there. Exactly. That's my kind of move right there. Um, it fires a massive number of rockets in a really short amount of time, and then it can run away really quickly. What is a massive amount of rockets, you ask? I ask how many is a massive amount of rockets? Thank you. So the 12 barrel of this M270 fires a dozen M26 rockets, doesn't sound like that much, and drops more than 7,700 bomblets, which I really love that they call them bomblets. Bom- that sounds so yeah. cute. It's outfitted, it does. It's outfitted with two surface to surface tactical missile systems with firing range between a measly 20 and 43 miles. So pretty far. And so, what's that really mean? Uh, it fires so many rockets in 40 seconds that it can completely blanket a one square kilometer area. And this is my favorite part. Being able to do that has given the M270 the nickname, the finger of God. (laughs) That is interesting. Yeah, I love it. All righty, my next one. And this one was, it was the top of every list that I was looking at. And you probably saw it too. This is the Ekronoplan. A cryoplan. So imagine the if biggest, ugliest, stubbiest airplane you could ever imagine. Oh, I know that one. Yeah. And it's so it, it's actually it's it's a ship 
like a water ship and it's a, a plane, but it's not a plane that can actually fly at altitude. So this was a Russian invention. And the idea was it would actually just skim across the water. So th the payload capacity was absolutely enormous because they designed this to carry like tanks and other pieces of equipment. They're literally gargantuan. Uh, but the reality is, unless you're going across like a massive body of water. And my guess is back in the cold war days, Russia was thinking they were going to drive we got across, some big bodies of water to drive across yeah. the ocean to attack us um, yeah. in these planes that don't fly. Yeah. So uh, as far as I know that I could tell nobody else other than Russia made them. Um, they're still in service today. They use them for, I don't know, various reasons, but it's literally the biggest, ugliest, stubbiest plane boat ship you could ever imagine mm, i love it i just keep thinking of tailspin the cartoon with blue flying his plane <laughs> i know that's not it but that's all i could imagine as you were that's saying that's not this. it uh moving on uh osprey till rotor military aircraft you stole like, another imagine one of imagine if you can there's a helicopter there's an airplane I'm singing sweet love tunes to them and they just make a beautiful baby that comes out half and half. Well, that's what the Osprey is. It's the world's first production tilt rotor aircraft. It's a hybrid that can take off and land vertically. So it could get in and out of like really tight situations. But once airborne, it magically like a transformer turns into a turboprop craft that flies super fast farther and higher altitudes than helicopters are able to reach 351 miles per hour. Oh fast. my God. Is that so fast? 25,000 feet high. That's five miles up in the air. Stinking helicopters can't do that. It's like a liger, you know, it's like better than a tiger or a lion. Oh my goodness. It is one of the, I have to admit it's, it's, it's up there on my list for coolest looking. It is very vehicles. cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one more from you, Luke. Ready? Uh, so mine, keeping with that that note, there was something called um, uh, the Lockheed XV, or XFV. So you were just talking about vertical takeoff and landing. So James, I want you to imagine, put your imagination hat oh, on. It's on. A plane standing on its tail straight up and then two opposing uh, helicopter style propellers at the front. So the mm. XFV was a vertical takeoff and landing ship that was supposed to do kind of what the Osprey did. Mm -hmm. But the problem was it could take off really great. Like it was good, but the problem was because it didn't have the ability to like tilt its rotors the way the Osprey does, it literally kind of dragged its butt through the air. <laughs> not so helpful. It could not actually do anything other than take off vertically. And if you remember, it was uh, uh, who was the guy in Marvel Universe with the red face was fighting um, Captain America. Um, oh, Red Skull or something like so that. So Red Skull in Captain America, I think the first Avenger, Red Skull takes off in a vertical uh style aircraft that's exactly what the xfv looked like if you remember whenever he left the plant when it was blowing up uh that's what the xfv looked i'm no like. stinking nerd i don't remember that stuff yeah and and basically no one could like find pilots that could actually fly it because it just it, it, it wasn't a helicopter yeah. it wasn't a plane it was kind of like this weird area in the middle very cool. So before we move on, and I apologize because this episode is going to run very long, uh, we're going to take a break for this week's Luke's rant. So my rant is squarely pointed at James. Mm. So like we it. do these podcasts. We tend we to record two at a time. Back. And uh, when we record these, sometimes I get a little backed up. The production of these solely falls on when my you capable say backed shoulders. Up, you mean... Like oh, meaning I don't, capability. yeah, production oh. capability. So, and those production capabilities fall squarely on my capable shoulders, mm. completely in 100%. So uh, I'm about six episodes behind right now, about two, three weeks. And uh, James was giving me a hard time. Uh, I offer, I offered for him to take the episodes and do the production, but uh, interestingly, he declined. So, uh, so my rant is, I think I need James to be a little nicer to me whenever it comes to the production value, because these take about 20 minutes a pop at least. So six of them, you do the math. I got a couple hours of production time uh, that I'm going to have to do. So, so James, be nice. 
I'm sorry, Luke. I apologize from the <laughs> bottom of my that, heart. That, that was the most insincere apology I may have ever heard. I can you know see it in I your face. I wish I had right now, Luke, would be a Zimwalt class destroyer. What? Yeah. <laughs> so not not one warship. So kind of not, not even cheating. But 32 of these really weird looking futuristic ships were planned to be built by the U.S. Navy. So kind of a cheat here. Um, super modern looking multi-rolled battleship with really crazy stealth capabilities so that, that was the big thing the way they were designed was to have a low radar cross section and like a really wave piercing hull so they could get places quickly through bad weather and not be detected i can't remember if this is the one or not but one of them would have like the radar footprint of like a fishing vessel and instead, oops, it was a destroyer that just snuck <laughs> up on you. So pretty, pretty cool oops, stuff. You're dead. Um, yeah, they're 50 times harder to spot than a standard destroyer, destroyer would be. Uh, it includes a super advanced gun system, which comprised of a 155 millimeter naval gun capable of firing LRLAPs, so long range land attack projectiles, over 80 nautical miles. If you listen to our wacky units of measure episodes that Luke has not produced yet, you would actually know what a nautical mile is. So go check that one out whenever sure. it gets posted. Uh, it can fire both tactical Tomahawk missiles and vertical launch anti-submarine uh, missiles as well. So super versatile How big for that protection be to and hold destruction. A vertically. <laughs> so crazy. I love it. Uh, so this right. is going to go a little bit faster because you've already said a bunch of mine and I'm not going to redo it. So I only have two more. So my Uh-oh. next one is the Sea Shadow. The who? The, the Sea Shadow. What's IX in Roman numerals? Like nine? 11, 9, something like that. So it's the Sea Shadow 9 529. It was, it was an experimental ship uh, built by Lockheed Martin back in the 80s uh, to test the stealth technology that was used Ooh. on the f uh, 117 Nighthawk to see if it would work with submarines. So this thing was a submarine and it was really weird because it had all these super choppy square faces on it, really similar to what's that big, uh, the Blackbird, um, the really big 71 SR 71. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was really similar to the SR 71. It was painted. Check black, out that episode, had all these, by the way. Yeah, it had all these like cool kind of angles on it. And what the angles did was exactly what you said. It reduced the radar footprint helped with, you know, stealth technology. Uh, this thing was so secretive at the time that when they did this, three different people made it like they actually manufactured it and then they didn't know the other part of the plan and oh, then wow. they put it together at a at another site so no one knew the you whole get your plan piece and it's too big and you're like, like oh boy oh. <laughs> it's like they used inches instead of yeah. <laughs> millimeters or whatever the number is so uh. this was actually the design of this because it ended up not being super secret after a while. The design of this was actually the inspiration for the 1997 James Bond film, Tomorrow Never Dies. There was a ship in Tomorrow Never Dies that looks just like uh, the Sea Shadow. Very cool. Um, I'm going with the F-35 Stealth Fighter. Uh, the world's most advanced single-engine supersonic stealth fighter developed by the US of A. Um, undetectable basically wide ranging capabilities include air to air and air to ground electronic strikes intelligence gathering and surveillance for reconnaissance missions um mach 1.6 so 1.5 times the speed of sound it comes in at a measly 80 million dollars measly per little piece of technology plane (laughs) uh anti-tank missiles on board cluster bombs as well as guided bombs uh, my favorite fact about this thing is that the pilots use helmet mounted displays. So super cool, futuristic, like movie stuff going on here. And each helmet costs between three and $400,000. So oh my goodness. That's, that's on top of your $80 million plane. Um, yeah. So that's, that's where okay. My that last one. one, because we had a couple of duplicates yep, uh, yep. and then you can run through your your last few is the Kawasaki KLR 650. I'm going motorcycle here, James. I'm impressed. So this was uh, basically, it it had a different name. I think it was called uh, like the Henley, I think was the name of it, but it was essentially a modified Kawasaki KLR 650. The engine was customized to run on diesel fuel or 
run on, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, jet fuel. It, it could actually run on certain levels of jet fuel because That's apparently, apparently NATO has a requirement that you can't run gasoline in any of their vehicles that are NATO approved. Uh, so it got converted to diesel or jet fuel. Um, this thing has a, so this is a, a, like an off-road motorcycle. Imagine like the coolest looking dirt bike you could have. Um, big knobby tires goes 121 miles per hour on a dirt bike. Seems completely safe and legitimate. I'm out. Uh, it has a range of 400 miles, and that's because on diesel, it can get 162 miles per gallon. Uh, it has some bulletproof paneling on it, and uh, it was it's still widely used in desert-type warfare and different places all over the Middle East where uh, NATO forces and U.S. troops are deployed. Excellent. All right, I'm going to bust through some of mine real quick like here, all right? First, the CV90120 ghost tank, not to be confused with the BH90210 Luke Perry tank. Uh, it's in service in Sweden starting in 2011, so this is very new. Four crew members inside, 120 millimeter, a uh, little, little gun on the top, weighs 75 tons, hits 43 miles per hour. So another super cool tank. But what's really cool about it is, first off, it's named the Swedish T-Ghost. So that's cool. It's a camouflage tank using BAE's adaptive camouflage to make it invisible to enemy thermal imaging systems. The ghost tank uses its 120 millimeter compact main cannon with fancy new technology uh, to reduce recoil and overall weight of the vehicle. You know, 75 tons, it's reduced. Anything that's a ghost tank is got to be cool. Right, Just it's saying. a ghost tank. Um, my next one, and I'm going to stop with this one because I did have an honorable mention I wanted to set, throw out there. Uh, so I'm going to say the top of my list is the Nimitz class aircraft carriers from the US of A. Um, real quick, like it had, we have 10 of them, uh, nuclear powered aircraft carriers. It's only the second largest carrier in the world uh, behind the Gerald R. Ford class, which is bigger. Um, also give a little shout out to the Midway because of just, you know, it's historical. Everyone knows the Midway mm -hmm. when it comes to aircraft carriers. Um, I put this one on there because they're amazing. Check out our episode on them, the floating cities. They are just absolutely absurd. If you ever had the opportunity to go on one, I suggest you do so. Maybe not for, you know, going to war, but just to check them out. Uh, it was really an awesome experience when I got to go on. When one. did you go on one? Uh, back when I worked for Bechtel, uh, okay. I got to go down to the shipyard and tour a nuclear submarine and an aircraft carrier That's and a little, cool. a little piece of James is in that design. So, oh. um, super cool about those. sure it breaks all the time. <laughs> That's the one problem <laughs> I did have, um, a couple shout outs, one for an honorable mention, the object 279. I love the name, uh, but it was an experimental tank used by the Soviet union in the 1950s. Only three of these tanks were ever made because Khrushchev decided that tanks couldn't be above 37 tons. Nonetheless, it was a super terrible beast, 60 tons of special purpose machining to fight across heavy terrain and would stop any other tank in its tracks. Like it, at the time, it was just the tank to end all tanks. Um, it also, what was really cool, could survive the shock wave of a nuclear explosion. And it was designed to withstand the radiological, biological, and chemical attacks. So That's pretty good. Super cool stuff. And then the last one, Big Wind, it was this tank that got converted into like these two giant, giant cannons that look ridiculous on top of it. But now it's been converted to shoot water through these giant cannons to help firefighters with extreme fires. So that very seems like cool. a good idea. I thought so. So let's hear it, Luke. What are you okay. thinking for the top 10? Okay. So why don't we do uh, just top five? I don't know if we have enough okay, time to top do top five. 10. So for me, uh, you have to put the Jeep in at number one, just because of at how I won. If, if I, I'd be surprised if anybody else would disagree other than you just saying, uh, I'm going to say me, it's going to be Jeep number one. Okay. I'm going to say the, um, uh, the Osprey number two, okay. the Vespa number three, the KLR 650 number four, and my number five's got to be the screw tank. 
and the screw tank. Okay. So those are my top five. And now let me hear yours and we can argue. My, my numero uno has to be, it has to be, obviously, the uh, Nimitz class aircraft carrier. My will, wife might not be able to point out a Jeep, <laughs> but she can tell you that that's an aircraft carrier. I will, I will concede if you make the Jeep number two. Okay. I'll, okay. I'll give Jeep number two. It is very iconic. Okay. So we got aircraft carrier number one, Jeep number two. When it comes to coolness, man, I think the ghost tank is amazing, but I'm going to pass on that one because the stealth fighter and all stealth jets in general need a place at the table. I think they are just crazy. I agree with you. The Osprey, I have to agree with. It's just sick. So how could you not have that on there? And uh, honestly, I think that would work out for me if you let me have those. Okay. Two. So what do we have? We have the aircraft carrier number one. Number one. one, The Jeep Jeep. number two. Okay. Osprey number three. Uh, Osprey's number three. Are we going, are we going Vespa number four? The, I think the a Vespa with a cannon on it that drops out of a plane. Come on. That is really cool. You're right. I don't think I saw And then that. I think, and then I think we do the stealth jet number five. And the, in the F-35. Yeah. All right. I think we have it. So there it is. The aircraft carrier, the Jeep, the Osprey, the Vespa. <laughs> And then the stealth jet coming in at a lowly five. I love there's a Vespa before a jet uh, oh, in our top that is five. amazing. Uh, if any of you have anything to contribute to this list, if you want to tell us why we're wrong, if you want to explain why we were exactly right, which we are, and tell us why these Vespas are so sweet, how about you email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. And until next time, see ya.